So I've already talked about registers, which are a simple device that can hold the state of a bus. And we've already talked about counters, which is a device that can count, usually up, but can also count down, and in some cases, both up and down. Um, but what about counter registers? What on, what on earth is that? Well, a counter register is basically just a register, so, you know, a device that whose value you can you can overwrite uh, using any sort of input on a data bus as well as a, a write signal. Um, you can write to the to the contents of the register overwriting whatever is in it, and of course whatever is in it will be retrieved on the queue output. Um, but then you can also count um, or increment that value as many times as you like. So if I go ahead and I load the value zero x one zero into the register um, simply by clocking the write signal. Um, I'll get an output of 0x10 on the Q output. If I then clock the count line, that value then increments to 0x11. Clock it again, we get 0x12. Clock it again, we get 0x13, and so on and so forth. And at any point in this sequence, what we can then do is we can take a new input, say 0xf0, um, we can write that to the contents of the register, and it will immediately overwrite it. So the defined behavior of a counter register is pretty simple enough. The question then is, how do we build one? Well, there are actually several different approaches that you could uh, you could take depending on your needs here. Um, and one of the simplest ones is to simply take a register with its uh, data input and Q output. We have the write signal there. And simply take its Q output and just feed it into an incrementer, plus one. Then take that value and just bring it back right into the uh, data input. That'll create a counter register. Um, if you want to, or sorry, it'll, <laughs> it'll create a counter. If you want to create a counter register, what you'll need is you'll need a mux to differentiate between um, the plus one input, which is actually going to go into the zero input and data in. And I know this isn't quite technically the same behavior. We're not clocking one signal to write and clocking another to count. We're actually using the same write signal as the clock and then just um, using the, the mux to determine which function is actually performed. Um, but if we leave this at a zero, what ends up happening is whatever values in the register is going to get incremented by one and fed right back into the register. We clock this and the value goes up by one. Um, if we change this value from a 0 to a 1, however, um, now it doesn't matter what the value of the register is or what the value of the plus 1 bus is. We're only considering the, the value on the data in bus. So whatever is on the data in bus, that's going to get passed into the register. Now, there are some disadvantages to using that sort of circuit. For example, the plus 1 uh, circuit here will most likely have a little bit of a delay if you're using a, a ripple carry adder. Um, likely, you will be using an adder, and you'll have to supply a... Um, a constant one input for that sort of uh, circuit to work. And again, depending on the type of adder you use, that could be uh, pretty slow. Um, but the advantage of that sort of circuit is you can actually scale it to multiple registers. Assuming you don't have to increment the value of any particular register or two registers at the same time, um, you can daisy chain a bunch of registers together through one adder circuit or one incrementer circuit, um, and you effectively get a bunch of counter registers for the cost of one. But of course, we've been learning about uh, counters in the traditional sense of tying together a bunch of T flip-flops. So using that sort of circuit, how might you make a counter register um, using that sort of thing? Well, you can't exactly use a T flip-flop in this instance. What you can use is either a D flip-flop or a JK flip-flop. And so what I'll do first is I'll show you how we can turn a JK flip-flop into one of these things. And then we'll also look at the case for a D flip-flop, which I would argue is actually quite a lot simpler um, and easier to build. So recall with our JK flip-flop, we can actually turn that into a T flip-flop by basically just tying the J and K inputs to a constant one. Now I'm just going to do that for now because we will actually be changing that. We won't be using a constant one for long, but we're just going to use a constant one for the time being to indicate that this JK flip-flop is considered uh, configured as a T flip-flop. Then for the first T flip-flop, we're just going to tie that directly to the clock signal, which I've now got set as um, falling edge sensitive. Um, and then for all subsequent uh, T flip-flops, what we're going to do is take the 
output of the previous T flip-flop, and we're just going to end it with the clock before sending it on its way. So what needs to happen in order to turn this in from a, a T flip-flop into a basically a, a D flip-flop, because that's what we're going to need um, in order to actually write the contents of, uh, of a data bus to this circuit. Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to change the configuration from a T flip-flop to a D flip-flop. Um, now, obviously, JK flip-flops, they don't make D flip-flops, but they can make SR latches. And so what we can do is we can take our D input and we can run that through an inverter. And if we tie that to our JK inputs, um, that will effectively turn this circuit into a D flip-flop when we clock the pulse or when we clock the, the circuit, um, the contents of D will, um, will either enable J or enable K, and that will either set or reset the contents of the flip-flop depending on the status of D. So what we need then is for these inputs to be one when they're in one state, the counting state, and then be the uh, state of D or the inverse of D um, if it's in another state. And we can do that simply by using, again, just some muxes. So we have the one input tied directly to D or D inverse. Um, the other one we can just tie directly to a constant one. Then we just add a bus passing through all the bits here to change the status of that, of that mux. And that will now change the, the behavior of this JK flip-flop from either a T flip-flop uh, to a D flip-flop, depending on the status of this line right here. Now there is one problem with the circuit, and that is of course, even though we've got the data inputs going to all the, the now D flip-flops, um, not every D flip-flop will be clocked, and that's because each one is dependent on the status of the previous D flip-flop in order for the clock to propagate. Um, so in order to override that, we basically need to inject an OR gate right into this feedback line right here. And so we simply put an OR gate in line with that, connect that up to the same line that controls whether we're using this uh, flip-flop as a T flip-flop or D flip-flop. And that's basically your circuit right there. You can, of course, turn this into a down counter as well by putting the XOR gate right in here still. Um, but that will basically behave as a single bit uh, counter register. And so that's definitely one way of creating a, a single bit counter register using a JK flip-flop, which is definitely um, doable given that the JK flip-flop can be configured as both a T flip-flop and a D flip-flop. But if you just start with a D flip-flop in and of itself, um, we can actually turn this into a T flip-flop fairly easily, and that actually makes the circuit a lot simpler. So if we first take the Q output of the D flip-flop and we simply invert it, and feed that right back into the D input, then anytime we clock this uh, D flip-flop, the contents of the D input will be the re direct result of the inverse of the uh, flip-flop's output. Effectively, every time you clock it, it's going to toggle. But again, we don't want it to toggle all the time. What we want is for it to toggle when it's in one state and then take the value of a bus when it's on the other state. And so what we can do is we can tie this into, again, a mux. We tie the inverted line to the zero input, and then we tie our D line to the other input. And so simply by changing the state of this mux, we can either use this D flip-flop as a T flip-flop or use it as its intended purpose as a D flip-flop. Likewise, instead of throwing the uh, OR gate on that feedback line that uh, would be used to propagate the clock from one T flip-flop to the next, um, we could also just put the OR gate right on the clock itself. So long as we've got that falling edge detection, this should work all the same. Um, but then what we can do is we can take our normal clock that we would have passing through as a counter, we can tie that to one input. The other side obviously would be going to the AND gate that would be connected to the Q output. And that would be our normal, um, basically our count clock. Uh, but what we can then do is we can take another line going through here, and this will just pass through to all bits and connect to the other input of this OR gate directly, as well as the MUX. And that will be our right line. So when we enable the right line, it's going to switch the MUX from the uh, feedback line to the D input. Um, it's also going to prime that clock input.
So when we release that write signal, it's going to fall and write whatever the content of the, the bus is into the D flip-flop, which, because of the mux, is whatever the value of D is over here. And then, of course, with either the JK flip-flop design or this uh, D flip-flop design, all you would have to do is just take the circuit and daisy-chain it for as many bits as you need, and you have yourself a counter-register. Now, obviously, there are other ways of building counter registers. You don't just have to use these three methods themselves. Um, you can pick whatever method works for you, whatever works within your constraints. If it works, it works. That's basically what it boils down to. But this one, I would say, is probably the easiest to wrap your head around and also the easiest to implement. So if you have a few uh, spare data flip-flops lying around, this might be the way to go. The only thing I would make sure of, of course, is just that the behavior of the circuit you're using is the one you intended. Obviously, I showed you two different circuits here, um, one where you have a separate count line and a separate write line, and uh, clocking each one of these will do a different thing. Um, but there's also the other configuration where there's just a single clock line and then a mode line, where if the mode is a zero, it's going to increment, and if the mode is a one, it's going to write the contents of the data bus to the register. Um, both ways are valid. You just have to make sure that whatever circuit you choose, it has the inputs that are going to work for you.